My name is Jacob Graves. I'm a principal engineer at Getty Images in Seattle, and I'm here to talk about managed search. So uh, introductions first, who is Getty Images? Uh, Getty Images, we are the global leader in visual communication with over 170 million assets available through our two main websites, Getty Images and iStock. If you have encountered our name, it's most likely you saw us as the <coughs> as the uh, credit on a picture accompanying a news uh, story, either in a, a newspaper or a news website. But the, um, <clears throat> the editorial photojournalism, although it's the most eye-catching part of what we do, it's only one small part, we also do a lot in the creative sphere, also called uh, stock. So we have a great many different types of assets. We do music, we do film, but primarily we do images. That's the, the bulk of what we do, pictures. And that's, the, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. So uh, let's talk about how we do search at Getty Images. Uh, we use a controlled vocabulary. And uh, one thing that's a little bit different about our context compared to a lot of solar cases is that the images don't have text as their content. So when you're, when you're searching against the text and the text is the content, then you can, you can rely on what you're the quality of what you're searching on, because if the text is garbage, the content is garbage. Whereas uh, a big thing with images, the, the image could be very good, while the associated keywords could be very bad. So you've got a, a, a bit slightly different context there than the, the usual situation. So what's our search process at Getty Images? When we ingest our images, we associate keywords from our controlled vocabulary with them from a a variety of different sources, as many as we can, can get, basically. And we load all that up into our Solar Lucene index. And then when people search, we tokenize and parse and map the uh, string that they've entered to our controlled vocabulary as well, identify all the keywords that uh, are appropriate for that, and return that set of images. And then we score them, and we return them in score order, and we also do a a uh, post-scoring shuffle, which I'll talk more about later against them. And that then determines the images that appear in front of our users. And so this is where there's um, <clears throat> kind of a, a divide. The, the details of the scoring of the, de the details of the scoring and the shuffle and which images are actually going to appear is all buried in Solar and Lucene, and it's a technical concern. Developers like me and people like me at Getty to do that, but the people who care the most about which images appear in front of our users, that's the user experience, are, are business people, people worried about keeping existing customers happy, attracting new customers, selling more stuff, all, that, all, those, all those people. So there's a divide there. And in order to try and bridge that divide, uh, that's why we created this managed search, is what we thought of it at the conceptual level, a managed search framework. And the aim was to empower our business users to take control over that user experience. And as I said, you know, search is critical to a site like Getty Images because you can't buy our images unless you find them. To allow our business users to take control over that without having to get us in technology involved in that process anymore. So this uh, managed search framework, uh, conceptually, it needed to do five things. It needed to hide that technical complexity from the business users, while at the same time giving them control over the different scoring components and the uh, custom shuffle, and allowing them also to balance those different uh, factors against each other. Uh, it also needed to give them feedback, immediate feedback, uh, on the effects of the changes they've made so that they'll be encouraged to try different things and to, to innovate more and also to allow visualization of the effects of their changes through empirical data, charts and graphs and such like. Uh, a lot of business users, even though they might not be so technically proficient, are often very good with numbers and spreadsheets, so that data representation is, is very important. So we called this framework Managed Search. So how did we implement this at Getty? Uh, three layers. Uh, we have the Solar Lucene layer. We have a middle tier, written in C-sharp, which is responsible for generating the select queries, which we pass to Solar, and also for parsing the JSON responses. And we got that there, so other uh, technology teams who want to interact with search from our site, from our API, internal tools, and so on and so forth, so they don't have to uh, 
really know much about solar. They don't have to work out how to construct the query URLs. And also because it allows us to control what they're allowed to do. So you know, they can't go off and decide to do a facet on every field, on every asset, on our index, and you know, bring, our, bring our site down. Uh, and lastly, we have the uh, web application for the business users called SAW, our search uh, administration workbench, which we wrote in the Java Play framework with lots of JavaScript. And it's worth calling out that those first two layers are also uh, used to serve up searches to customers on the site. They don't exist just for this kind of search tool. So here's a, a diagram, uh, our enterprise architecture diagram representation. We've got the, the solar on the left with the index and the data, and we've used a few plugins to get all the functionality we need. The middle tier in the middle, as is appropriate for its given its name. Uh, and then the, uh, the two ways into it are business users go through SAW and they pass in the algorithm settings when they say they want to search. And then I said site, but really site API. You know, any and one of our, our users come in through there. And the difference is they just say they want to search and we assign within the middle tier, we assign them scoring and shuffle settings. And we have a database where we store those and we push to it. We allow the SAW tool to push to it to give our business users control over what the users are experiencing on our site. So uh, how did we, what, did, what does SAW have? And I'll be focusing mostly on this the rest, of the, the rest of the way. It's five main areas. And these five areas are also, you can think of them as the five steps that a business user has to go through in order to change that user experience. If they want to have people experience our images in a different way, to have different types of images pushed up towards them, these are the five steps they go through using this tool. Uh, the first part is the scoring, again, the, the shuffle, the controls that allow them to determine how that takes place. Uh, secondly is a preview, so just very quickly they can get the user experience. They search and they see the results for what they've typed in, the images that would be returned if they were actually on the site. Uh, the single page and scale report charts, that's the uh, empirical representation that I talked about earlier. It, uh, we collate the data by, uh, by individual scoring component and um, turn it into graphs and charts that they can interact and play with. And for that part, being able to export to Excel is uh, obviously a critical critical thing to be able to do. The difference between the two, the single page charts just works at the preview level. It's whatever search they typed in. It just takes the results of that and gives you a graphical representation of what you're looking at. And the scale report uh, operates against the full spectrum of uh, searches that take place at Getty Images. Obviously, not every search because you'd have to wait forever, but we select a proportional sample to get a good representation of all the different types of search that people do. And uh, it takes longer to run, obviously, because uh, it's having to execute a lot more searches. And lastly, there's a live test page, and this is what gives them control over what the actual real users are experiencing. They can assign test algorithms to small percentages for A-B testing, and they can also control the actual live sorts, the default uh, sort experience that different groups of users will be experiencing when they interact with our site. So the scoring breakdown, um, I'll talk about the scoring a bit first and then the custom shuffle. So to help, uh, to help our business users understand and control the scoring, we broke it down into three main areas, uh, relevancy, recency, and image source. And relevancy is that part that's relative to the search. So it's the most important part. It's how likely, given what you typed, is this image to be what you want to see. Uh, recency is just age and date, so they can push fresher images up to make sure that uh, our results don't go stale. And image source is all those attributes of the image which are not contextual. They aren't keyword based, but they can still have an impact on whether we think it's a good image or not. And for us, this is mostly around image quality. We have various fields that can tell us whether it's likely to be a particularly attractive image or not. And we use that one more as a, as a tiebreaker. And for each of these components, we exposed uh, two types of parameters to allow our users to interact with them. One type is the type that controls how it operates internally. And the second part is a weighting or boost so you can control the various strengths of the different components. So if you want to emphasize recency at the expense of relevancy, you can turn the dials a little bit and give one a bit more oomph. 
So here's a screenshot of this, and you can see pretty, pretty straightforward, just the fields where they enter the stuff. I know some of these labels are a bit different than what I talked about. We did a bit more than those three components, but those are the three basic ones, and conceptually, that's the important part. Uh, so I know it, it's a little bit different. Uh, I hope it comes across, but the work on the GUI was a lot of the work of this application, uh, putting this together to make it intuitive, because the whole thing doesn't work if the, the GUI isn't, isn't good, if it isn't something that the business users find powerful, intuitive, and they like working with. And this was a bit of a new experience for us, because we're primarily, you know, in search, we're back-end developers. You know, the, the prettiness never really comes into it. So we got some, we got some front-end people involved and uh, got some work done on that. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of trial and error, and do it this way, you know, do it that way. I don't get this. And I'd, if you're doing this, I would recommend the, the big advantage you have with an internal tool like this is it's not strangers out on the internet whose behavior you have to work at. It's actual users within your company. So a really good way to make it work is to identify a power user, embed them in your dev team, and just get a really quick feedback loop going. So you can actually build it for one of the people who will be using it the most. Uh, so I hope that hope that comes across. It looks pretty simple, but it was a lot of work, you know, making it the right way. So let's talk about the architecture of the scoring. So obviously, as I said earlier, the immediate feedback is important, um, which really pushes us towards favoring query time. Uh, there's lots of ways to do boosting in Solar Lucene, but one of the big splits is uh, index time versus query time calculation, whether you're doing the math up front ahead of time or whether you're doing it when they search. And the payoff is index time is more performant because you've already done the math, whereas query time gives you more control because you, can, you don't have to re-index things in order to change them. Um, so the approach we took, because the, the immediate feedback was so important, we tried to favor query time over minor performance gains. And the word minor is important there because obviously you can't, you know, speed is, speed is so important. You can't, you can't turn down the overall performance in order to give your business users control. But yeah, so there's, a, there's definitely a balancing act there. And we are doing some of the stuff up front at index time, but we tried where possible to favor query time because it gave extra control to the business users. Um, the approach we took was we defined minimum performance metrics. And uh, when we'd made changes, we'd roll them out to a small segment of the users and use A-B testing and latency monitoring to ensure that we were staying within the performance boundaries that we need in order for our website to be fast and uh, fast and effective. And we, um, <clears throat> we found actually that the performance hits were, were pretty small. Uh, Solar does the query time boosting. It, it's very quick as long as, as long as you're just doing math operations. If you start doing the term frequency and that stuff, it can slow down a bit more. But I think we were helped as well partly by our use case. It's rare for our searches to return more than a million assets for one query. And you know, you split your index across five shards, that's just 200,000 documents you're doing the scoring for per query, which, I mean, it depends obviously on the hardware you're using and stuff, but that isn't particularly much work to do. Uh, we use the uh, value source plugin uh, to create our own boost functions. Uh, we found doing everything through the existing boost functions. We could do the stuff we needed to do, but the URL stings kept growing and growing. And I mean, it worked fine, but it created, you know, this is an enterprise tool, so we have to worry about people trying to support it in five years. And massive strings are difficult to test and understand what's happening. Whereas, you know, a Java class that lays out everything that it's doing and you can write unit tests for is much more, it's much more sustainable, we found. So let's talk about the individual components. The most important one, like I said, is uh, relevancy. And we measure relevancy for our images. As I said, it's because the, the text isn't the content. We rely on user interaction to uh, tell us whether this keyword is appropriate for this image or not. We lean very heavily on that. That's our measure of, of relevancy. Uh, we use a form of the standard TF IDF term frequency inverse document frequency that they use for the default Lucene scoring because it does such a great job of uh, normalizing between popular and unpopular keywords. The one issue with it is I, it's the one thing that when I try and explain to the business users what's happening at this point and I start getting into this, eyes will glaze over sometimes. So 
but you know it's just too powerful to not use it really. You, so you have to have to live with that. Uh, and there's also a boost to uh, weigh the to weigh the relevancy relative to the other factors. One of which is recency. So this is just age, just how old the image is. Um, the way we did it, we exposed three different curves. They can choose one of three different curves. Uh, linear, which is just a straight line. Reciprocal, which is the standard high, then low, and tail off. And a reversed reciprocal, which is like the fall off a cliff. You go along, decline slowly, and then drop off a lot. And also exposed appropriate, uh, appropriate parameters so they could control the shapes of those curves. And that gave them pretty much, pretty much full leeway to do whatever they like. We may have to add more options in the future if somebody wants something else. but it, covers a, a really big range of use cases. And again, there's a boost. So the, uh, the curve part, the actual numbers that control the curve aren't that meaningful in and of themselves. So you can see we put, a, put on the GUI a little plot so they can see what it is that they're actually entering. And it's much easier to interact with and see the aging curve that they're creating rather than just exposing the, the pure numbers. So let's talk about image source. And this is the least important and also the most dangerous um, of the scoring components because this isn't relevancy related. This is, this is, like I said, it's attributes on the image that aren't tied to relevancy. And with us, it's, it's mainly quality, how good of an image. You, we have different sources of images, some of which are more reliable than others. There's fields to allow users to say whether, uh, our contributors to say whether an image is quality or not, although obviously that's not always completely reliable. Uh, so it, it's, there's me enough meaning in there for it to be worth using, though. And we use it primarily as a tiebreaker. If the, the score is pretty similar from the, other, from the other factors, let's give a boost to the higher quality one or the, the likely to be higher quality image. Uh, we did go back and forth a bit about this one because this gives the business users the power to create an awful user experience if they so choose. Because if you turn this up, you'll destroy relevancy and you'll get all kinds of garbage back. But, you know, the... And enabling people is partly about giving them, giving them power. Um, so the way we implemented it, we actually used just a single field. We, we have different sources of quality, and we collated them down, grouped them down into a single field, partly uh, just to make it easier to manage. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, different boosts interacting with each other and ending up over overwhelming your scoring if it's a single field that they're working with. And also, it gives a slight performance hit because you're having to operate over things. Uh, then that's the, uh, that's the scoring components. Let's talk about the custom shuffle. So this gives our business users even more fine-grained control about the actual order the images appear in. So it's, it's similar to a sort, uh, the traditional sort that you get in solar, and it takes place at the same place in the, in the pipeline. Uh, it really can be thought of as an alternative to sort. But instead of just sorting by fields, you actually implement it yourself and choose which types of images you want to put in which places. And the, the big driver behind this is diversity. All our, all our images are images, but they can be quite different in terms of the source of where they came from, the licensing, the um, exclusivity, and that sort of stuff. And so it can have a, a difference on the quality of the images. Obviously, the more exclusive uh, ones from our more professional um, sources, our partners, are going to be more polished than the uh, ones that are contributed by more, by less full-time professional photographers. And it can have a big impact on our users during their purchase experience as well. So we want to make sure that we have a diversity of these different types of image. And also, different groups of users uh, interact, are interested in different groups of images. So we want to emphasize different classes of our images. So the the shuffle allows them to actually get down to the level of saying, I want this type of image here, this type of image here, this type of image here, actual slot, slot choosing. Uh, we used a new solar plugin in 4.9 called the Rank Query plugin to, to do this. And our implementation of it, we used a single field. Again, we were, and with this one, um, <clears throat> you, need, you need broad groups, obviously, because if your groups are too narrow, there won't be a wide enough range of images in each group to give you the required relevancy for the slot that you're choosing. So we made them collate all those fields down to a single, a single property again. And then we uh, take in a mapping of slot to tier. Sorry, we call this the uh, field image tier, uh, but it comes from several different sources. And then we take a mapping of slot one, image tier two, slot two, image tier four, and so on. 
And then after we've scored the images, when we're uh, getting the, the results set together, we, we use that mapping to say, OK, the highest scoring uh, image tier one image goes here, highest scoring image tier two, and then, oh, we're back to image tier one, so that gets the second highest, uh, second highest one for that. And we pass, in the, we pass in that mapping at query time so they can control the, control the shuffle the same way as they do the scoring. So that's enough about the <coughs> uh, scoring and shuffle details. Let's look a bit more at the GUI, uh, the Search Administration Workbench. Uh, so the preview page is the, uh, just the results of the search. It lets them do a search and see it as they would if they were a user. They get the images. And we also display the score breakdown so they can see the results of the, the, results of the settings that they've put in. And we, uh, we, use, we get that by running in debug mode against Solar, which is slow, obviously, but these are internal users. So if they have to wait an extra second or so, it's not, it's not going to impact anything. They can wait. And we show them the breakdown to allow them to see, with any given image, why is it here? Why is it here? So they can drill down to that level of uh, that level of detail. And here's a here's a look at it. I searched on kittens because everybody loves kittens. And at Getty, we have a fine we have a fine selection of cute furry little kittens. So you can see here the breakdown of the score listed underneath the images. Uh, we went back and forth a lot with how to display the score in a meaningful fashion because if we don't display enough, they can't figure out our business users why an image is somewhere. But if we show too much, if we were to put everything that we could pull out of the debug uh, response from Solar, it would be overwhelming. So we kind of did a, a two-step thing where on the main page, you just get the top-level component roll-up, the amount that each component contributed to the score. And they can click on click on a button and get a little pop-up, which will give them a more detailed breakdown of the scoring that took place. So then there's the single page charts. And this operates on the, the same data. So it's you do a search, you've got a single page of data, only instead of just looking at the results, this collates the scoring component data and puts it into a graphical form for uh, ease of interaction. And we, we went with three main types of charts. Um, we've got charts that do the the distribution within an individual scoring component, like here's the relevancy breakdown, uh, a chart that does the comparison between the different components. So it's a, a single chart that shows how much of the overall score came from each of the components, taking the components at the top level. And we have one to show the results of the custom shuffle. Because you know, even though they say, I want this slot, and then this slot, and this slot, there has to be an image in the results with an appropriate score for us to put it in there. So it doesn't always come back exactly the way they were expecting. So that lets them see whether the, the actual percentages they got were close to what they were expecting with it. Uh, the, with the graphs, as I said before, being able to export Excel is uh, an absolute must with those things. Uh, business people like, like Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we use the D3 JavaScript library, but there's a lot of other good ones out there. So let's look at a screenshot. I chose our busiest chart. This is the one that has the different scoring components broken down by time. So we can, we can look at the, how each component contributed to the overall score across the set of images. Uh, it's interactive. They can change the time range. And if they click on the individual data points, they'll get a little pop-up with you know, more numbers about what's behind that, that particular one. So scale reports. And this is really, again, the, we go through the, the areas of the SAW tool. It's like the different steps towards pushing out an algorithm. So, if they're happy with their settings, they like the way it looks with the searches that they do, and they've got the charts that are confirming, oh, that's, yeah, the numbers say what I was expecting, what I think I'm seeing. The next report is to say, what happens across all the searches rather than just my favorite little searches that I'm executing? That's where the scale reports. And this takes uh, longer to run, obviously, because uh, it executes 1,000 queries and collates the data from each one and combines it together to give you Similar charts, but across a much wider range. Um, the uh, 1,000 searches we generated from a proportional sample of several years of uh, search data. We wanted a, a good mix of popular and unpopular, of ones where we had great results, ones where our results might not be quite so perfect. We just want a good mix of the full, the full user range. And uh, very important to make sure you throttle that, because if, you're, if your management tool brings down the site it's managing, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big fail. So here's a, here's a screenshot of it. We used a lot of pie charts for the internal uh, 
internal for displaying the distribution within each component. We found them to be pretty uh, pretty meaningful and also very easy to to take in at a at a glance. Uh, so then we have the live tests, and this is where our business users get to control what our actual users on our site experience. So A/B testing uh, primarily, but also the the live default sorts. So this allows them to take the uh, settings that they've created uh, to assign it to to a test group and to set the percentage of users who will experience that test versus a control. And like I said, it also lets them set the live sort. And one one thing we found with this tool, a kind of nice side effect, it also makes a very good um, diagnosis tool for what's actually happening on the site. So if somebody comes to us and says, this image here that so-and-so searched on, why is it there? We can point them at this tool, have them choose the same algorithm settings as the site, and then they can see the the breakdown of how the offending image managed to, to make it to where it was. Uh, so after they've set up the live tests, then they need to monitor the KPIs. Uh, we didn't try and do too much here because we have a whole analytics team and framework that can do much more detailed. So we just really put a, a very top level uh, click through rate. That's the most important of the KPIs that we use. And we get a feed from the existing analytics framework to, uh, to get that. So, in conclusion, uh, our self-sufficient business user uh, wants to make a change to the user experience because they think it'll be beneficial for our users. And so they come up with their idea, and then they go through these following steps to make it happen, all without involving technology, which was really the, the kind of goal of the whole thing. Uh, obviously, not everything, not every idea they have can be, uh, can be dealt with by this. They, they operate within the constraints and boundaries that we've set up for them. But as long as they're within those boundaries, can go through this. First thing is they change the algorithm settings on the algorithm settings page. They execute single searches and review the results visually, see if they like what they're getting, and look at the score breakdown to see if it's doing what they want. Then they look at the single page charts to get a, a data representation of what they think they're seeing, see if it's good. Then they execute the scale reports to see what it looks like across the, the full set of searches. Then they set up a test algorithm. They assign it to a percentage of users, and they let the A-B test run while they monitor the KPIs. And if they like it, if it's all good, they push it out to the live users as the new default search experience. Uh, so I've put in at the end here uh, just some details about the plugins that I mentioned, if anyone's, uh, anyone's interested. The value source is very well established. There's lots of, lots of good stuff on the internet. The rank query is, uh, is a newer one, um, and if you want to if you want to try doing it, I'd recommend going to the tests because they have a the, the test class has a good implementation that just makes a makes a great starting point for that. And that is that is the end. So, uh, do we have time for Q and A? Any questions? A couple of minutes. So, if anyone has any questions, uh, if you think of anything later, I'll be attending the rest of the conference, and my email is jacob.graves at gettyimages.com. I'm happy to hear from anyone who has any thoughts. So. Uh, yes, about the score, you say that you have uh, many components by registry, by relevant query, and in some way you have to produce a, a score for each result. I want to know if you sum all these components or you multiply all these components. Uh, some. We use some. So we lent towards the boost functions because it, we just found it was cleaner, so we're summing those up. Um, kind of the opposite. It's, it's really been pretty restricted to the people who are using it at the moment. We're hoping it to push it out to more of them in the future. At the moment, it's the, just the business users who are primarily involved with search. So the people who are coming to us to get us to make changes. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it's been like so far. Uh, we're hoping to get people who are less familiar with search involved with it in the future, but we've been concentrating on the power users up to this point. Uh, for the li for the live ones, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, you know, we've we've locked it down a bit, so not everyone can just go in and change our the live sort. At the moment, it's just one user who actually has the power to do that. No, two, 
but um, yeah, yeah, they, you know, we put the power into their hands. So. So one more question and then I'm done. So with this relevancy or this assuming that they're doing this, this global or I mean search window comes in once they've applied it and it's not just a test group or is it per set of keywords? Oh, uh, kind of targeting. Well, it, it depends. We have, there's not just one search that everyone in our site experiences. No, there's uh, targeted ones, but some of them are, you know, the, primarily we've been focused on the default search because that's the, that's the biggest one. But, you know, we do target different search experiences depending on, you know, the, the site you've come in from, the, how you've accessed it, the sort that's been chosen. Some of them we assign, some of them uh, we also expose to the users. They can choose some different kind of large search settings, you know, like best match, newest, that kind of thing. But, no, it's not just one search for, for everybody. But, you know, the, the, the main default one gets a good percentage of the users. Okay, thank you guys very much. And as I said, if you want to send an email, if you think of anything else. <laughs>